Here we go. Jake and Josh are here to analyze the game they love for the team they love. This is another Dolphins Podcast. Here's your host, Jake Mendel and Josh House. Thanks for tuning in to another edition of another Dolphins Podcast. We are settling into the NFL New Year. I have a list of about 30 names, 15 players who have left the Dolphins, roughly 15 who are joining the Dolphins. That's that's too many players for me, so... Joining me to talk about the latest moves that the Miami Dolphins have made. Joshua Houts, Brian Kett. Happy Friday, gentlemen. Happy Friday. It's uh, you know, a lot more action from the Dolphins and free agency than I was expecting. So uh it's been a it's been an, a, a pleasant surprise. Uh some good, some bad, but uh overall mostly good. Yeah, that's how I'm feeling, and I'm glad we're able to come on here and you know, we're gonna get into all this. But happy Friday, boys. Glad we're able to do this and uh Hopefully your weekend goes uh, just as good as your week, I guess, because it was a busy week for the Miami Dolphins. It started with a bunch of panic. Christian Wilkins signs a four-year deal with the Raiders, $110 million. Andrew Van Ginkel becomes a Viking, the least surprising sentence out you'll ever hear me say, two years, $20 million. Uh, the second, Brandon Jones got a three-year, $21 million deal from the Broncos. I knew that the Dolphins weren't going to be re-signing a lot of their players based on uh, how some other teams around the league feels about this team. Uh, Cap, before we really dive into some of the moves the Dolphins have made, is there one uh, player who left the Dolphins and it's kind of surprising to see uh, where they landed? Not especially. I mean, to me, I, I always expected a lot of free agents to leave. I, I didn't expect Christian Wilkins, Robert Hunt, Andrew Van Ginkle to be back um, just because of, you know, the lack of money the Dolphins had in the future. And, you know, Christian Wilkins, kudos to him. I mean, look, I I thought he made a foolish mistake last year when, you know, the market for defensive tackles in his draft class was was so clearly defined between, um, you know, Quinn and Williams, Ed Oliver, uh, Dexter Lawrence, and uh, somebody I'm forgetting here. But anyway, it was really clear where Christian Wilkins could ask for and what he could expect. And everything I've heard is that he was he was asking for more than what Quentin Williams got last year at five years, 100 million. And I thought that was a foolish ask at the time. And he comes out this past year, improves greatly as a pass rusher um, and gets nine sacks. And he earned every every penny of that for the Raiders. Am I kind of happy the Dolphins didn't pay it? Yeah, still, but not as happy uh, as as. Uh, I would have been much less happy last year if, if, if they had paid that. Yeah, I was just going to say the biggest surprise, I guess, would have been the Wilkins, Hunt, and Jones contracts, just what they made. I mean, normally as Dolphin fans, you, you know, put these guys up a little bit of a higher tier. You know, Robert Hunt's on this, you know, one step above what maybe the national media thinks. Christian Wilkins, you know, we hyped him up. You know, we were as big, we were gassing him up. I never thought he'd go out there and make that type of money. So, like you say, kudos to them, but the Dolphins had no chance of retaining them. So, um, we move, right? We move. There were some gripes, and, and I could completely understand it, that when you look at the contract Andrew Van Ginkel got, two years, $20 million, I think that was the one a lot of Dolphin fans were like, hey, hey, whoa, whoa, slow down. We, we can pay that. We can keep Andrew Van Ginkel here. Um, but, Kat, I think that kind of speaks to Miami's changing identity kind of at, at defense with Anthony Weaver coming in. Uh, it's not a defense that really leans into having a defensive tackle play 98% of the snaps or whatever Wilkins is out there. But for me, it was seeing Van Ginkel leave. And then also, I mean, Deshaun Elliott going to the Steelers for two years, $6 million. That was another one where I was kind of like, whoa, hold on a second here. Let, let, let's talk about this before you just go and leave us. Yeah, Deshaun Elliott was one I would have liked to have had back for two years, $6 million, uh, because it basically el- completely eliminates the the need for a third safety. And in this defense, it looks like that's going to be a big thing. So the Dolphins do still have a little bit of a need there. But there are a lot of safeties that are still out there in the free agent market. Um, Now, going back to what you said about Van Ginkle, yeah, I think offhand you can make the point that two years, $20 million, the Dolphins could have paid that for Van Ginkle. But this tends to be a defense that, you know, Van Ginkle can kind of be a positionless player. He's not – necessarily an every down edge setter, even though he's a talented guy. So that's where I think Shaq Barrett comes more into the equation. I mean, even though Barrett's 31 and declining a little bit, he's still 
for only having four and a half sacks last year, had a lot of pressures, had a lot of hurries, had a lot of hits. He was top 25 in those areas, uh, for, according to PFF. So it makes sense to me, uh, even though I it, it kind of sucks to lose Van Ginkle overall. Yeah, I'm with both you guys. It sucks losing Gink, and I would have loved to have Deshaun Elliott back, but you hope that Chris Greer and the Miami Dolphins have something up their sleeve. Um, uh, going back to what you said about the defensive tack, uh, end position, I mean, I, I hated seeing Andrew Giggle go, but once that Shaq Barrett signing came down, you kind of understood it, and now you see you know, Jalen Phillips moving along. Just seems like he's rehabbing well, so um, hopefully him and Chubb are back out there sooner than we expect, but I think Shaq Barrett can come in and get some production early on and at least fill that void until those guys are ready to go. I'm keeping my eyes on Shaq Barrett just just in case because there was a guy here named Andre Branch. There was someone here named Emmanuel Ogba. The Dolphins have done a very good job at signing these one-year uh, bridge player, uh, bridge level, excuse me, I should say, defensive ends. The issue comes when it's that next offseason, then I'm giving him that three-year deal, and you're just kind of stuck at, at wondering why did they do that. So I, I like the idea of Shaq Barrett coming to Miami. $9 million isn't too bad, but the second we start talking contract extension, just going to give you a backhand real quick about that one. This also does kind of let you know how the Dolphins feel about Bradley Chubb and Jalen Phillips. Uh, it does seem like every week I I'm going onto Twitter, I'm going onto Instagram, and I'm seeing Jalen Phillips out there getting one step closer to recovering. It would be great to see him out there at the beginning of the year, but Kat, do you think that the Dolphins are done at edge rusher? You know, you have Barrett come in, especially early in the year. The weather is nice. He should be able to thrive with the other weapons the Dolphins have on defense. Uh, but do you see them bringing in someone else? Or are you kind of hoping, leaning, praying that Phillips will be the guy to come back? Yeah, the, part of the reason that I'm glad that they uh, signed uh, Shaq Barrett is because I did not want them to use – the 21st pick in the NFL draft on an edge rusher, because I thought if you end up drafting a Jared verse from Florida state, if he fell or a um, lot from, uh, from UCLA, if he fell to 21, I thought we'd be sitting here in a year having the same conversation about, well, now he's the third best player, our best edge rusher on the team and there's nowhere else to move him. So I'm glad the dolphins signed Shaq Barrett. Um, May not be done at edge because, look, they had three guys that tore ligaments in their legs in the final month of the year. So I expect them to add somebody in, you know, maybe it's a Melvin Ingram. Maybe it's a Jason Pierre Paul again, who played for um, Anthony Weaver in Baltimore. Uh, somebody like that or a Justin Houston, someone like that, kind of a somebody who can help you for the first six to eight games of the season. Uh, Jalen Phillips is ahead on his rehab. Um Bradley Chubb, I expect I'd be shocked if he doesn't go on PUP to begin the year. Phillips might as well. So, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. But Barrett is a great a addition there, and I expect them to add another veteran along the way. Yeah, I don't think they're done at all. And I think it goes – I we talked about it heading into free agency and into the draft. You know, Chris Greer loves to plug these holes, right? Jake, you know the guy that put – plugs a hole with his little thing. Yeah. I mean, that's what he's doing, right? He's getting as um, signing as many pieces to the puzzle that they can go out there and, you know, fill the depth role or at least start if need to be. So um, I'm fine with it. I, I joke that they're just throwing all these different bags of potatoes. there, defensive tackle next to Zach zone. That does seem to be what they're doing with these uh, low key signings. Josh, I got to ask you, the dolphins have signed about 10 players on the defensive side of the football alone. Xavier Howard, he's not at the team anymore. Emmanuel Agba, he's gone. Jerome Baker, he's gone. I think he's visiting with the uh, Titans, if I saw that correctly. Uh, if you had to look at this list, uh, who'd be the big Christmas present underneath the tree? Yeah, well, you're right. I think Jerome Baker's also now visiting with the Seattle Seahawks. I think that came yep. out as soon as we came on here. But yesterday I came on here and I said Jordan Brooks. I was real stoked on that. I mean, the more film you watch, the more you can see what the Dolphins saw in him. You can see the different, um, you know, what he can bring to the run game. He's solid in coverage. So that would have been my answer. But then as soon as I think we got done recording or later that evening, you know, Kendall Fuller, man. Kendall Fuller, the Dolphins signed him. We were talking about what the Dolphins might do next, Jake, on that podcast. And I think I said they're going to go cornerback. And I was reading down the list of best available. And there was Kendall Fuller. I don't think we thought the Dolphins might go out there and, you know, bring in a name such as that. I mean, two years, $16.5 million. That's a solid contract. And um, still need to dive more into the tape. But this is a guy who I think can play on the outside 952 snaps last season on the outside only 
uh, 28, I believe, or 25 on at corner or at nickel. So that's a he does have some versatility there. But you put him on the outside opposite of Jalen Ramsey. Then you have what Cater Kohu at nickel. I mean, some people are saying the secondary might be better than last season's, and it's. I don't want to say it's hard to argue, but it's looking pretty good, man, especially when you think about Xavier Howard, his struggles with his groin. You know, he was getting up there in age. I'm, I'm loving this move with Kendall Fuller. So um, I think it's an upgrade, as crazy as that might sound. So that would be my Christmas present under the tree. Um, what are your thoughts, Kat? Uh, absolutely. I mean, Kendall Fuller does a couple of things. Uh, on the outside, 500-plus snaps last year. And, you know, my rule with uh, PFF is that if it's overwhelming – overwhelmingly good or over overwhelmingly bad, then it's something I pay attention to out of 132 qualifying cornerbacks that played 20 plus snaps last year, he was eighth out of 132 and most of them were on the outside. So now you've got Ramsey and you've got Fuller on the outside. You keep Cater Kohu inside in the slot where he put, played 500 plus snaps and he's best at anyway. And now it also allows Cam Smith to kind of, uh, you know, simmer a little bit behind Jalen Ramsey as that long-term cornerback. So it doesn't completely take cornerback off, off the need board as far as the NFL draft is concerned, but it allows them at cornerback to go best player available if they want to go that route uh, at pick 21. I think it's so easy to fall in love with a lot of what the Dolphins have done because it's not long-term life or death decisions the Dolphins are making here, right? Uh, Kendall Fuller, two years, $16 million. I mean, Raekwon Davis just got two years, $14 million from the Colts. It's so surprising. It's shocking to see how this stuff really develops and how you see uh, the roster get built. Kat, where do you list this combo of Ramsey and Fuller within the last couple of years? I mean, we thought it was Brian Flores that absolutely loves his cornerbacks, bringing in Byron Jones to be across from Xavier Howard. But is it actually Chris Greer who absolutely needs his cornerbacks? For me, Chris Greer is basically an order taker as GM. And I don't mean that necessarily in a bad way. I mean, if, take a look at under Brian Flores, Byron Jones and Xavier Howard were press man cornerbacks who – undertook a lot of responsibilities. Jalen Ramsey and Kendall Fuller would not have been a combo for Brian Flores because they are not the fastest. I mean, Jalen Ramsey, yes, he's he's fast. He can do everything, et cetera. But um, he's more of a zone guy. And Kendall Fuller is exclusively a zone guy. I mean, you 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 go back to why he fell in the draft years ago. I mean, he ran a four, six, seven or something like that. It was very, very slow, but he plays faster than that. So in zone coverage, he's phenomenal. But as far as press coverage, not the same guy. So, yeah, I, I think that's big. And then also, too, they signed Jordan Poyer one year, $2 million. A year ago, the Dolphins were, you know, considering giving this guy seven or eight million. And, you know, he's, he's you know, what, 30 in his early 30s. I know that. Uh, uh, but he's not the fastest guy either. So you're going to have a fast or, or a, a smart but not very fast secondary here with the Dolphins. I'd have written down 33 years. So, yeah, I mean, that's – again, that's that upgrade. So, I mean, we're sitting here, we joke. It was supposed to be Byron Jones, Xavier, and Howard. Then, you know, Jalen Ramsey, Xavier, and Howard. Now we got Jalen Ramsey and Kendall Fuller. I'm excited for what it's become. I mean, we came into this, you know, it was a little bit doom and gloom, losing some of these players that we're all fond of, you know, that we sat here and root for for, you know – X amount of years, but with all these changes they've made, I have no issues with what Chris Greer is doing. And it just makes you realize that sometimes you just got to sit back, relax, and let everything play out before, um, you know, you get the pitchforks ready and go after Chris Greer and company. How are we feeling about the secondary? Are we ready to start labeling it, you know, no fly zone? I mean, Jordan Poyer, he has all the accolades. He's an absolute stud in the secondary. Do we think they're done here, Kat? You mentioned that cornerback might be in play, but Poyer does kind of seem like an ideal bridge safety if you wanted to maybe draft someone second round following Javon Holland's footsteps. Yeah. And I don't, I think they could go into the season right now with what they have and be fine. Um, maybe lacking a little bit of depth, but no, I mean, when you're talking about Nick Needham as your, you know, seventh defensive back, then I think that you're in pretty good shape. But on the other side of it, there's a lot of talk about moving Jalen Ramsey around. So if at pick 21, if you see, somebody who falls down to that spot, like a Quinion Mitchell from Toledo, like a Terion Arnold from Alabama and say, I can't believe this guy's here. Then yeah, I think you should absolutely pull the trigger. And that's what free agency is for so that you can get to a point where you say, we've got, we can go into the season with this and we'll be fine. 
We may be a little short in some areas, but we'll be fine. Let's go ahead and take the best player on the board at 21. That sounds music to my ears. And that's, um, you know, I'm, again, I'm liking the way this thing's all coming together. I don't think they're done by any stretch of the imagination. You mentioned how we could use another safety in here. We were hoping it was Deshaun Elliott. We'll see what they do there. But moving Jalen Ramsey around, that's very fascinating. We can't forget Nick Needham was cross-training, I believe, at safety too. So maybe that's something that they, you know, kept him around for. But Kat, you, you talk about going into the season as is. So you're telling me right here, right now, you know, March 15th, you're ready to go into the season with Neville Gilmore, Jonathan Harris, and Benito Jones as your core uh, defensive tackle unit? No, I'm talking about in the secondary that <laughs> you might be able to go, go in with that. And at linebacker, you might be able to as well. No, defensive line is uh, – is a mess right now. And look, they've added some rotational pieces. Um, uh, you know, Benito Jones comes back, Benito Jones, who would have thought what three years later, this guy would be your starting nose tackle on the depth chart. That that's not good. I mean, <laughs> and, uh, at defensive end, Neville Gallimore is somebody, uh, out of Oklahoma when he came out of, out of college, you know, he was, he was, went in the third round of the Cowboys. Um, I saw some, mock drafts had him in the late first round at the time. I thought that was in- embarrassing, but this is a guy who basically he can make some plays in the backfield, but um, abandons his position and his gap so much. Yeah, he did that at Oklahoma and as a pro, he's been a disappointment too, but it, you know, one year, $1.8 million. Hey, it basically a glorified tryout. I'm fine with that. Jonathan Harris, um, from the Broncos has is six five two ninety, but you know has has been kind of a meh player too, and it, that hurts me to say because he went to Lindenwood University. I'm a graduate from Lindenwood here in St. Charles, so he's one of the very few players that 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 is in the league from Lindenwood. But no, the Dolphins have a lot of work to do on on the, in the defensive line position. And as I tweeted the other day, um, the guy I won is Calais Campbell on the free agent market. Because if you sign him, um, this is a guy who I know he's ancient. I know he's 38 years old, but he played at 37 last year. This is a guy who played really, really well for the Falcons. It played 700 plus snaps, just like Shaq Barrett and just like Jordan Boyer did. So this is somebody I hope the Dolphins can add. Um, ideally after uh, April 30th, where they wouldn't lose a comp pick in the seventh round for him. But I mean, it makes too much sense for Calais Campbell to not be a Dolphin right now. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping for that and for him to shore up the position for at least one year. Yeah, speak all that into existence. I mean, I guess I'm sitting here saying I'm excited for some of the changes we made, but you look at the defensive line, and I guess that would be where you're sitting here still wondering what could be. I mean, I again, I joke that they're just throwing all these bodies up there, but when you have a guy that came in here, you know he's familiar. He's a defensive line coach, right? I'm going to trust that he's going to bring in some guys that at least are going to be able to rotate around next to Zach Sealer, next to all those other pieces they have and get the job done. But, you know, when you just lost Christian Wilkins, it's definitely looking much different. You mentioned Gallimore. Um, I think it was Ian Rappaport tweeted out that he was working with Austin Clark um, at some point. So there is a little bit of a, you know, a relationship there. It does seem like, you know, maybe Mike McDaniel and Chris Greer are giving these coordinators their opportunity to go out there and get some of these guys. I mean, Saran Neal came out today, the special team gunner, and said that, you know, he has ties to Danny Crossman. So it kind of seems like they're going out there and getting to pick their own ingredients. But um, yeah, that defensive line is definitely something to keep an eye on because it's not going to be the same as much as we'd like as it was last year with that big body, Christian Wilkins. Speaking to Neil just for a second here, that's the one thing I, I... I'm with everyone, the frustration, like, why on earth is Jake Bailey going to be our punter again? Why are we bringing back Danny Crossman? But if we wanted to try to do the mental gymnastics and make it work, this is someone who, uh, before arriving in Miami, he was the special teams coordinator in Buffalo. He has over 10 years of experience doing it. So you're just praying to God they can make that work. Um, Ken, I wanted to ask you specifically about Jordan Brooks because uh, we mentioned his name a little while earlier. He arrives from the Seahawks, three years, $26 million deal. Um, I saw him sign his deal on Instagram. Graham and uh he looks like he is meant to be a linebacker he is big he looks he could be very physical um what are you thinking this linebacker group's gonna look like because when we're thinking about how this Dolphins team needs to win and how they're gonna win it all starts with pulling down Josh Allen yeah and when Jordan Brooks was signed I was a little bit surprised because I I tend to look at off-ball linebacker as more of a non-impact position but Anthony Weaver and you look at, you know, 
how, how the Ravens have, have worked their defense over the last few years with, you know, Patrick Queen and CJ Mosley and a lot of these other inside linebackers, uh, they value that position more. So Brooks started to make more sense. The more I started to think about it, you know, three years, 30 million, uh, but basically kind of a two year contract. He is a strong physical downhill linebacker. Um, and when he came out of Texas Tech, you know, 240 pounds, ran a four, five, four, forty. He was really regarded as only a two down player. But since he's come in the league and this is what I've observed and, and looking back at, at some of his games here with the Seahawks, a lot better in zone coverage than he was coming out of college. So that makes him more of a complete linebacker. And he brings an attitude to the table, too. I mean, you look at uh, in 2022 in week 17, he tore his ACL and came back the following year in 2023 and had the type of season that he had. So that shows his toughness. So I, I, I'm liking the, the, the addition more and more. And um, Anthony Walker too, I, th I think was an underrated guy too at one year, 1 1.8 million, kind of a limited two down player. But uh, I, I think Brooks brings more to the table from a coverage perspective than I originally thought he would. He may not be as good as Baker in that regard, but, he brings a lot more physicality um, against the run. So overall, uh, I do like it. Yeah, I mean, I, I love it. I, I love watching these linebackers. We mentioned he has that little visor. You almost see Carlos Dansby if you look, you know, he's squinting a little bit, you know, you know what I'm saying? So he's coming downhill. He's a thumper. And you mentioned it, man. He's pretty good in coverage. I mean, Dolphins Twitter's out here making it sound like he is Peter Pan's shadow. I don't think he's that good in coverage, but he's not really a liability like some of these other guys have been accustomed to. So we're sitting here talking about how the secondary might be upgraded and look, you know, better than it has in years past. I have to sit here and wonder if that's not going to be the same thing we're seeing about this linebacker unit, assuming it all comes together and continues to play the way we all hope so i love the jordan brooks signing but um yesterday that would be my big present under the tree then kendall fuller signs do you wonder if i mean jerome baker he's been playing behind christian wilkins for so long was it as simple as like all right man you've been doing this for so long wilkins isn't going to be here we got to find someone who hasn't had the luxury of having this guy absorb two three bodies at a single time um it seemed like every single down with someone like Christian Wilkins. Uh, I love that you bring up Anthony Walker. Who would you compare him to in terms of maybe past Dolphins? Because I, I completely agree. I don't want to make it sound like he's going to come in here and be an absolute stud the next coming of Zach Thomas. But I absolutely love his story. Someone who called plays on defense, a former team captain. Uh, I kind of go to a Landon Roberts, even though he did turn into a starter for a few years. Um, so I'm like 10 years older than you guys, so I'm thinking if you're going to uh Derek Pope is who I'd compare him to if you remember him he's for limited player two down player he's going to play 300 snaps per year or so but yeah that that would be the type of guy I'd compare him to and if if we get that I think that's fine Josh what do you have to say to that? I was just gonna say sounds better than Channing Tyndall and that pains me to say that <laughs> I do know Derek yeah. Brooks is though you can't say you're 10 years older than me I'm I'm 37 I think yeah, thirty. Wait, hold on, hold on. Were we comparing Jordan Brooks or Anthony Walker? Walker. Okay, okay. Walker, yeah. Derek Pope. Jordan. Jordan Brooks is. See, I think I haven't liked uh, a lot of the inside linebackers the Dolphins have signed just at first glance in like the last ten years. Like Kiko Lonzo, I didn't like. Uh, uh, I didn't like Landon Roberts at the beginning, and then I I liked him more as as time went on. What about Lawrence Timmons? Uh, Timmons, no, Timmons, <laughs> to Lawrence Timmons. <laughs> he couldn't even get out of the airport. He couldn't well, even get out of the airport. <laughs> exactly. Lawrence Timmons was a crybaby that went back to mommy before the first game started. No, that guy, see, look, I, I never hold grudges against players, but when they quit, like before a game, uh, yes. Yeah. You can go to hell for life. That goes for Lawrence Timmons, Jonathan Martin, uh, uh, Brent Grimes is on that list. Miko Grimes, uh, See, Ricky Williams, I said that for a while, but I've learned to respect and like Ricky Williams more. But uh, um, he, yeah, I, I, I understand why he did what he did now. Does uh, Laramie but, Tunsil belong on that list? Remember he fell in the bathtub one time? Fell in the, no, 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 no. I don't go that far. <laughs> I don't go that far. No, no, no. T T Tunsil was a godsend. I mean, he, fell, he puts on a gas mask, uh, goes back in time, hops into a time machine, puts on the gas mask, and falls to the Dolphins at 13. God bless Laramie Tunzel. We're he's, talking about he's the, only 
He's the only reason we can sit here and watch uh, the Dolphins lose in wild card games every year for Laramie Tunsil. Thank you, Laramie. <laughs> I'm trying to think here, just going through any final notes. Um, I want to talk about the offense here. The Dolphins haven't done a bunch. I mean, just, just to kind of wrap it up here, Christian Wilkins, Andrew Van Ginkle, Raekwon Davis, Deshaun Elliott, Xavier Howard, Jerome Baker. These are big, big names of the defense who have been here for so long. Uh, to bring in a group headlined by names like Kendall Fuller, headline like a name like Jordan Poyer yes one year two million dollars but for us fans like it's it's pretty easy to get hyped up for someone like Jordan Poyer a lot of work to be done I mean obviously the games aren't played until August and September but um I I like the direction the Dolphins are going in to rebuild this defense they don't have to put any of the chips uh into the middle of the table with any of these deals which I think makes it easier uh but overall I'm I'm looking for a new start with this Anthony Weaver defense. I, I'm done. I was thinking of just years of being absolutely demolished by Josh Allen. Let, let, let's we got to try something new. I'm ready. I'm ready for the Weaver experience. Uh, yeah, I mean, I I think the Dolphins got better at cornerback. I think Kendall Fuller's better than Xavier Howard was last year. I think you know Jordan Poyer is better than Deshaun Elliott. Even though I would have loved to have Elliott back as a third safety at Defensive line is clearly worse after losing Raquan Davis and Christian Wilkins for a bunch of basically seat fillers. And, uh, you know, at the edge spot, yeah, the Dolphins are worse, but it's because they lost Chris or they lost uh, Jalen Phillips and they lost Bradley Chubb to, you know, torn ligaments late in the season. So I thought Shaq Barrett was a good response to that. And uh, at inside linebacker, Jordan Brooks, I would probably take over Jerome Baker. So, you know, there's some good, there's some bad. The Dolphins, overall, my top concern on both sides of the ball is, are you going to be able to be physical enough up front to compete with these better teams? All about the trenches, baby, right? I, I agree with you guys, though. I think um, you can see where they upgraded clearly. You can see, obviously, the hole in the middle of that defense, that massive hole left behind by Christian Wilkins. But I was huge on Vic Fangio. That was the guy I wanted. I thought that he was going to come in here and fix all of our problems. I'm not saying, you know, that defense didn't improve. But um, I'm ready to sit back, relax, and then Anthony Weaver we trust. When we start looking at the draft and what the Miami Dolphins need to do, the last couple months, it was a little awkward, right? The Dolphins had 30 players who were about to be free agents. We didn't know the exact position the team is going to be in. I do think they're working towards that best player available. It seems like every year, mid to late March, we do have that pod where it's like, well, Chris Greer did it. They at least have enough to go through and add uh, whoever they feel is that best player. However, I don't think the Dolphins are there yet, Kat. I'd love to get your thoughts because you mentioned the one thing this team really needs is that physicality, that uh, toughness in the trenches. So far for like the trenches, they've added Aaron Brewer, a six foot one, uh, quote unquote, undersized center. That doesn't really feel like it fits that bill. Yeah. And look, Aaron Brewer, I, I don't have a problem with the signing per se. And there's not, there were a lot of options at center and guard and, you know, re-signing Connor Williams is still an option for the Dolphins, but it's more of a long-term option. Um, you know, he's, I, I would like to get him back under contract. I don't care if it's at left guard at center, what it is, but look, Aaron Brewer is a perfect scheme fit for Mike McDaniel. He's incredibly athletic. He's yeah. He's only six one two ninety, and he's unbelievable in space, but there's another part of it too, where he allowed the most pressures per drop back last year as any center in the league. So how do you reconcile those two different things? And that's where I get a little bit confused at. Um, so he's somebody that also does have experience at left guard at right guard. And last year was his first year at center. Um, he also played tackle a few times. So he's incredibly versatile, very athletic. Don't have a problem per se with, with the signing, but, um, I think another part of it, too, is this is a draft that is going to be predictably really deep at interior offensive line and and actually the entire offensive line um, deep into the second round where the Dolphins are going to have two picks. Yeah, things are setting up nicely here. As far as Aaron Brewer, I mean, 
again, Connor Williams was fine, right? He made a nice transition to center. He's looking really good. I mean, some of those snaps, we want to get those down. But as far as, you know, pass protect, run protect, he's good. So I'd love to bring him back here, you know, have another option at center, let him move to guard like you mentioned. Um, but as far as Aaron Brewer, you said, you know, he's got that speed to get, you know, out in front of some of these speedy guys that we have, a Devon H. and uh, Raheem Mostert, things like that. So you can see where it is. I just don't know that Dolphin fans, it almost seems like they're sitting here chalking this up as a huge win. I see the highlights going around. I think I even probably – uh, retweeted him, but you know, he stopped Christian Wilkins. It's actually there, what on like two plays, and the everyone's just losing their mind. So, I'll temper my expectations. But, like you mentioned, with uh, the free agents that were available, not knowing whether or not Powers Johnson might fall to you, if that was you know one of your options there, um, bringing Aaron Brewer in, I'm not gonna be upset with that. But you definitely have to sit there and wonder when you mentioned those pressures, you know, giving up those sacks and things like that. I mean, a lot of people are sitting here pointing to the Will Levis and some of the quarterback issues there in Tennessee, it's just as much on the center as well. So, um it's not a surefire signing. You know, we're not going to sit here and say, okay, the offensive line's fixed, but I'm okay seeing what Aaron Brewer can do after that year he had last season with the Titans. What are the odds he actually starts week one, would you say, Cat, for Brewer? Say 90%. 90%. I mean, yeah, wow. be, when you give a center $7 million a year and Chris Greer is a GM that's known to give money to players that are kind of either – at the back end of the career or are starting to ascend from the previous year. And Brewer is the latter there. So it, I, I don't, there's an option to move Brewer to left guard or right guard. And that might happen if like, if, if they're thinking, Hey, if Jackson powers, Johnson falls down to 21, maybe you move Brewer to left guard, but I don't think that was their intention. I, I think their, their object here was for, was for Brewer to be the opening day center and to go from there. Interesting. I, I was kind of under the impression, sniffing around the idea of that maybe um, I was even willing to go down to like a 65 percent ish and, and maybe Brewer could be just that 1A backup on the interior of the offensive line despite other issues. I've been wrong multiple times, most times, and I'll probably be wrong here. But uh, yeah, this could be just me hoping they still go with a center and offensive lineman in the first round of the draft i think that's going to be a need either way so robert hunt out the door i think cedric wilson just signed with the saints braxton barrios there's some rumblings about him but when we speak about you know signing a offensive lineman like aaron brewer and how it was a no-brainer to kind of lock up someone how is kendall lamb still kind of lurking out there i thought he'd be someone that a team might tackle uh early on uh on a one or two year deal maybe a little more expensive just because you saw what he could do when you give him the playing time yeah, and Kendall Lamb played well last year, given the opportunity. But um, there, you know, there are a lot of uh, tackles out there like Kendall Lamb uh, right now, especially veteran tackles. I mean, you're talking about it, it, the most, which is kind of odd, like Tyron Smith is still out there. Makai Becton's still out there. Uh, Trent Brown, Josh Jones, Yash Nijman. Uh, those guys are out there too. So it doesn't surprise me that he's there, but, you know, given the opportunity if Kendall Lamb was to come back on minimum contract again, I would certainly welcome that. Yeah. And a lot of those names though, I kind of might welcome as just that depth piece, you know, that could maybe fill in there, see, you know, just throw a dart and see what happens. You guys are sitting here talking about the offensive line and how the plan is Aaron Brewer. I agree with you, Kat. I do think he's pretty much um, going to start for sure. Um, I was just though wondering, they draft Powers Johnson. You know, they bring back Connor Williams on a friendly deal. You move uh, Brewer to guard. You have Connor Williams at guard. Then you got Powers Johnson in the middle. I mean, that offensive line is absolutely disgusting, right? I mean, then your offensive line's looking dirty. You got versatile pieces that can, you know, play at center if they're called upon. Obviously, I'm just uh, throwing that out there. But I like the Aaron Brewer signing. I do think he'll start, whether it's at center or guard, but um, still work that needs to be done. Although it does seem like the Dolphins feel like they can plug and play people at guard. You know, they signed Robert Jones. We got Liam Eikenberg as well. So um, in Butch Barry, we trust, right? We saw him last year prove a, a lot of us wrong. You know, they were we were more worried about the offensive line than they were. Um, I'll sit back and let this thing play out. But um, decent signing on at center. I just don't know if it's a huge upgrade. Yeah. So, and one thing, if, if the question is, what are the odds of Brewer starting? It's, it's a hundred percent. I mean, he's going to start, well, no, 99.9. If you know, I, I don't know how sturdy his stairs are, you know, it, so we'll see on that, but uh, you know, 7 million a year, you look what the Dolphins have at center or guard, this guy's starting somewhere, no doubt about it. Um, it the question is, in a, in a draft that has, you know, uncharacteristically some good centers, 
you know, Jackson Powers Johnson, uh, Zach Frazier from West Virginia, you know, Graham Barton from Duke, uh, three guys who probably should go in the top, you know, two rounds of the draft. If one of those fall to you, do you end up kicking Brewer to left guard or right guard? That that's going to be a, a interesting conversation if if that that happens on draft day. To be fair, I mean, Cedric Wilson was making seven mil to have limited snaps. Yeah, but then you need someone to fill that role. Th- then right <laughs> after that, Tyree they Hill, traded right? Tyreek Hill. Got they got, got Tyreek Hill in a trade. Cedric, good for Cedric Wilson too. I mean, I, I he and Tua were never on the same page, just ever. I don't know why, but. Uh, I think going to another team where you, he's more of a boundary outside receiver, contested catch guy, I think is a great signing for the Saints. So, but he was never going to work here again. The other wasn't two the same. Signings, sorry. I, I was just going to say it wasn't the same since Tyreek Hill called him onion head set. I think it was all downhill from there. <laughs> the only other two signings the Dolphins have made on the oh. offensive side of the ball – Janu Smith, Jody Fortson, Janu Smith, two years, 8.4 mil. Jody Fortson, I think it's a one-year deal. He didn't play last year. He was recovering from injuries. Uh, I wrote a story on the Finsider about Fortson, and the only stat that's worth sharing is that, yes, he has uh, 14 receptions over his last two years of playing time. Four of them are touchdowns. So, Kat, to me, it sounds like the key of this Miami Dolphins offense taking the next step is locking in and finding that red zone threat in a tight end. You know, Jody Fortson, uh, funny, I live in St. Louis and can't, everyone's adopted the Chiefs now as their, as their team ever since the Rams left. Uh, and somebody in our office fantasy football league took Jody Fortson in like the last round of the draft said, this guy's going to be great. And then he comes out in week one, I think he scores two touchdowns. And I was like, oh my God, does this guy know something? Um, and then he got hurt. So, uh, I don't have much background in Fortson, but he was a wide receiver coming out of college. And then um, PFF graded him as a blocking tight end in the 80s in the limited snaps that he had. So when you talk about tight end being a traits driven position, I I like this signing. I think this is a very underrated signing, you know, ju- in really on an offense where Julian Hill had 360 snaps last year. Ju- I mean, Hill was a rookie undrafted free agent who looks the part, but this guy had 360 snaps. He had six catches and he fumbled one of them. I mean, so I, I like that as a developmental tight end. And I think John Smith is very underrated as a signing. I mean, somebody who at, at times was featured with the Falcons, even with Bijan Robinson and, and Drake London, um, they're on offense. So I, I like both of these signings. I, I think they're clear number two and number three tight ends. Also gives the Dolphins flexibility if they want to cut Durham Smythe, which I wouldn't want, but if they want if they did cut Durham Smythe, that would create some additional cap room if they get in a situation where they need to sign sign somebody else. Yeah, I mean, I have no issue with either of these signs. Getting another guy in there to, you know, maybe groom. You mentioned his capabilities as a blocker. I didn't realize he had those two touchdowns. So I bet you were just sitting there thinking this man had a time machine or something. The fact that he came out there and scored two touchdowns. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be completely honest. I think I went on there after I was done playing with the kids or something. I thought it said Jody Foster at first. I was like, what are they – like, who are they – what are they talking about? As for John Smith, I mean, you touched on it, man. He is a guy that can be featured. He has that speed. Um, you stop. see him with the motion and things like that. I mean, I – just finished up watching John Smith, and I'm excited for what he can bring. Caught 50 of 70 targets, 582 yards, three touchdowns last year. Again, John Embry is our tight end coach. So um, let's see what he can make out of these guys. I do think tight end is going to be uh, – our group's going to be better this year than they were last year. I just nabbed uh, John U. Smith in, in Dynasty. He was a free agent, so I spent I spent one fab on him. should have looked. Nice. <laughs> Going through this list, Josh, I I really like what the Dolphins are doing. And I think, you know, when you look at the roster, it's super important to keep in mind that Jalen Waddell and Tyree Kill are going to get so much, so much, so much volume in this entire unit that when you want to bring in a wide receiver three, they need to be fit fit into a specific skill set. One, they either need to be able to do a front flip while catching a ball like Braxton Barrows, or two, the other option the Dolphins are really going to have to lean into is finding someone who you kind of just accept that, hey, they might not get all this attention for four, five, six weeks, but just in case a Tyree Kill or Jalen Waddle can't go, we can trust them to have six or seven targets. So, Kat, I, before we wrap up here, I want to ask you, seeing these Dolphin signings, has it adjusted how you feel they'll attack the draft? <clears throat> 
Yeah. Uh, part of me believes that they've set things up in a way where it's going to be a meat and potatoes type of first and second round uh, on offensive and defensive line. And I did an exercise yesterday where I took seven top 50 big boards uh, from, you know, kind of the mainstream media guys like um, Jordan Reed and Field Yates from ESPN and and Trevor Sikama for PFF and a few other guys here. N- nobody too far off the grid, but it basically combined their boards. And of the top 54 players, um, 18 of them are offensive linemen. So when you think of that, 18 offensive linemen, the top consensus 54, you got to wonder if part of the strategy here was to fill all the other positions and then go offensive line with the first two picks in the draft here to complete the other two spots there. Maybe come away with a, you know, for example, a, a, a Patrick Paul in the second round and a Jackson powers Johnson in the first round, or, you know, something like that. But it, it doesn't make a lot of sense of why the dolphins have completely neglected an offensive line that was so much of the reason why Tua had to get rid of the ball so quickly last year, but they've addressed all the other positions. So that's going to be interesting to see. Do they go offensive line first round or and or second round, or do they go best player available? It always seems to me, I mean, every year it kind of you, you change how you feel. I feel like they go best player available, but we'll, we'll see how it ends up. I do think that um, my opinion stayed the same. I mean, I think we were kind of talking offensive line. You know, I think maybe cornerback. I mean, there's still – Maybe options that go there. I, th- I don't think Edge might be on the board anymore as much as we had thought. But um, every time I think of that, Mike McDaniel, I go back to him saying how that's his fair position to scout and how he just really won that first round pick. So I don't think it changed too much, but who knows? I mean, I think they'll go best player available. And maybe if a wide receiver were to fall on, right? We're still sitting here talking about other options on this offense. I mean, could they potentially go wide receiver? I think that's something Cat talked about on a previous pod, some of those names. So, um, yeah, it didn't change my mind, but I do think Chris Greer will go best player available. And let's be honest, they're still not done. This is only, what, four or five days into free agency. There's a lot more stuff that's going to happen over the next few weeks. And you mentioned it. Uh, what McDaniel wants to do with this first round pick is pretty important because this is his first first round pick. So we really don't have a big tendency to follow here. We have Greer's track record, which we continue to kind of repeat time and time again. But that is it. That is all the time we have today on another Dolphins podcast. Thank you all so much for joining us. Go have a wonderful weekend. We will talk to you soon, but until then, fins up. Fins up. Fins up.